hear me? OK. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you so much for coming. I know it has been a busy week or weeks interviewing a lot of people. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for that kind introduction. And thank you uh, for the search committee to like, give me the opportunity to talk about my research. So before we start talking about like how we can use science and policy to restore and conserve tropical forests, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So when I was growing up, this was the context I was pretty used to. So every time we were traveling around like the city or like even Colombia, we were seeing landslices. And as a kid, I was fascinated because in these landslices, some species were able to grow back and others were not able to grow back. And I was like, What's going on? Like, what are the pressures? How some species can make it? How others cannot make it? So there was one species that I was really excited. And like, most of you are going to be familiar with this one. And this is Cecropia. And this basically motivated me to study biology. So I went to the University of Antioquia. A lot of you might be familiar with this institution. And I, um, thanks to these amazing mentors, spent a lot of time looking at herbarium specimens, mentioning uh, functional traits and spending time researching in the tropicals database about this genus because i wanted to understand which species were growing in these land slices but my excitement about um, the taxonomy and how these species were able to colonize didn't stop there that's why i joined oops, a phd program at the university of minnesota where i explore how these pieces were able to grow back in these land slices or degraded ecosystems. So I was looking at how when we add fertilizers or when we don't add fertilizers, these plants can grow back. And halfway through my PhD, I was like, this is amazing. We have a lot of information. We know how, can, how species can grow back. But are we translating that into policies? Like people know about this. And most of the time, the answer is like, no, we're great at publishing papers, but we're not great at communicating our science. That's why um, this January, I started a postdoc at Yale University, trying to link our science with the policies, like talking to the people at translating these into real actions. So um, without further ado, I want to tell you that this is a really exciting time to be a restoration ecologist. And even though I've been thinking about restoration ecology for like more than 10 years now, just looking at the taxonomy and looking at how plants access nutrients and how we can grow ecosystem back, like everyone right now is thinking about this. So I cannot be more excited about this moment, but also I have to be pretty careful and responsible because right now everyone in this room has a huge responsibility because we need to make sure that during this decade, we can accomplish all the targets we have because we need to fight climate change and we need to make sure that we're not losing our biodiversity. But there are many ways to approach this. And one could be just like thinking about the landslides I was so familiar with and just waiting for nature to do its thing. So plants are gonna colonize, they're gonna grow back, we don't have to do anything. And this can happen in a lot of places, but the reality is slightly different in other areas. And this could be kind of like the context of Madagascar, where plants are not able to colonize, Part, plants are not growing back. So how can we ensure that these plants that are going to be planted are going to grow back, they're going to establish? And at some point, like how we can make sure that these amazing initiatives that we have, where like companies and countries are saying we're planting millions and billions of trees, are going to like be functional forests or are going to provide ecosystem services. Like this is not tricky. And what I want to do is like, I want to make sure that all these seedlings that we have been planting for years, one day are going to be trees and then they're going to become a forest that is going to be functional. So this is my goal. And I want to use both science and policy to make sure that these things are happening. And I'm going to walk you through how I have been doing this through these years. So first, I'm going to be talking about how we can use biology to inform these decisions, then how we can implement these biological knowledge in like real ground uh, practices. And we're going to be looking also at the cost effectiveness, because we as biologists don't think about the cost of these things. But restoration is really expensive. And everyone is talking about how expensive it is and how we should not be doing it. And then the last one is how we can integrate all this information with policies. And once I convince you that all these things are important, I want to show you how we can integrate this 
at the botanical garden, how my knowledge can help the botanical garden scale these actions up. So let's start by talking about the biology. What do we know and why this biology is so important? So going back to this area that could be Madagascar where plants are not growing bad and we need to start planting trees, we can think about what a plant might need, what a seedling might need. And in that context, a seedling is going to need sunlight, is going to need water, is going to need fertilizers or nutrients if you want to put it in that way. And in this case, I'm going to be talking about mainly nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium as nutrients. But we know a lot about how sunlight and water can impact plant growth and establishment. But there is a big unknown here. We don't know much about nutrients. Everyone is saying, oh, the tropics are phosphorus limited. So we suppose if you add phosphorus, plants are going to grow more. But is this actually true? Is this happening everywhere across the tropics? Well, let's see. So we're going to focus on nutrients right now. And I'm going to show you what I have found so far. So when we think about nutrients, a lot of you will agree that if you add fertilizers or if you add nutrients, plants are going to grow more. But in some cases, especially in your gardens, you're going to find out that sometimes you add fertilizers and your plants are not happy at all. So is this actually helping or not helping? If we add fertilizers to a restoration project, are plants going to grow more? Are they going to establish? These are a lot of questions that I have been thinking about lately. So with this idea in mind, and you cannot see the points because something happened here. We, I conducted a meta-analysis and we were looking at both field studies and shade house studies and imagine that you're going to see a lot of points across this map that is the tropics and uh, just for you to know like in Africa we only have three points and in Asia we have a few of them but most of our studies came from South America and Central America. So we were looking at like what people have been publishing, what we know about like field studies and shade house studies that have been adding nutrients to seedlings. Are these seedlings growing more when we add nutrients? So I'm going to walk you first through how we're going to read these results. So on this side, we're going to have the type of experiment, field studies and shade house studies. These are the sample sizes. So these were how many seedlings were getting um, eaten a control treatment, which was like no fertilizer or a fertilizer treatment. And here we're like basically combining everything from like nitrogen to nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, anything you can think about. And then if our point is going to be here and the standard error is here, that means that when we were adding nutrients to these seedlings, these seedlings are, were growing less than the control. So the control was actually doing better than the fertilized plants. But then if our dot is here and our standard error is here, that's going to tell us that our fertilized plants were growing more than the control. So what we found, or what I found when I was conducting this, was that indeed, if we are fertilizers, plants are growing more. Uh, and in field studies, plants are growing about 30% more when you add fertilizers. And in, fields, in shade houses, they were growing 65% more. And this is a big difference between these two studies. Like, you are seeing less growth here and more growth here. But does this translate to the field? Because this is just me like doing a meta-analysis. This is like what we know for the tropics. So what would happen if we translate this to the field? So I decided to translate this to the field and to go to a tropical dry forest. And these forests are really interesting and exciting. And they're interesting and excited because they're in danger. A lot of these forests have been cutting down and we have less than 2% of them globally. So it's really important for us to understand how we can restore these systems. And on top of that, these forests experience this extreme seasonality. So during the rainy season, these forests is going to look like this one. But dry season, it changes a lot. So imagine you being a seedling and you experiencing these contrasts. And on top of that, imagine that you're growing in this kind of soil where you don't have a lot of phosphorus. Because this is what we think is happening here. Phosphorus is limiting and you have this kind of soil, plus you don't have a lot of water. There are two important functional groups growing in these forests. And one of those functional groups is the nitrogen-fixing um, plants, and a lot of them are part of the legume family. 
and they can associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria in exchange of nitrogen, uh, sorry, in exchange of carbon. And then we have another group that cannot associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria, so they have to get the nitrogen from the soil. So if you think about how these two groups function, you might expect differences. And I was wondering if these two groups were behaving in different ways when we were adding phosphorus. So for that, I established a shade house experiment in a tropical dry forest in Costa Rica in collaboration with this amazing thing where we had like undergrads, we have some field techs, we have a postdoc helping, a PhD student, and even my mom. So in this field study, uh, a shade house study, um, we grew 11 different species. Four of them were able to associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria, and seven of them uh, were not able to do this. We grew all of them in one soil type, and we exposed them to different treatments. We had a control treatment where we didn't add anything, so plants only had access to the soil, to the phosphorus that was in that soil. Then we had a low phosphorus and a high phosphorus treatment. These plants were really happy growing in this greenhouse for four months. And after that, we harvested them because all this team was helping me. And I measure around 15 functional traits. But today, I only want to focus on two functional traits that are important when you're thinking about restoration. And the first one is going to be photosynthesis. But before I show you the results, I want to walk you through um, how these results are going to look like. So here on the horizontal axis, you're going to see the different treatments we added. So we have the water, which is our control, low phosphorus and high phosphorus. On the y-axis, we have our response variable, which is going to be the maximum photosynthetic rate, so how much carbon these plants can actually fix. And then color-coded in green, you're going to see the plants that can associate with nitrogen-fixing bacteria and the ones that cannot associate with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And by the way, because I know our audience care a lot about taxonomy, all these plants um, belong to the legume phase. So these are Favaceae. So let me walk you and show you the results. So what we found, indeed, is that when we add phosphorus, these plants can photosynthesize more. So they're fixing more carbon. So this is telling something to us. Like, it seems like phosphorus is doing something. Plants can photosynthesize more, so that could have implications into practice. But this is for, like, the end fixers only. So what's going on with the non-fixers? Well, we're seeing a similar pattern. But there are huge difference if you compare like how much photosynthesis is happening here versus here. And this is just one variable. How about if we look at like how much biomass they are storing? Is it changing? Are we seeing a similar pattern? Well, indeed, we saw a similar pattern. We saw that when we were adding phosphorus to end fixtures, they were able to like store more biomass. So let me show you what happened to the non-fixers. But I guess you already know a little bit about that story. Well, yes, they were growing a little bit more, but this was, not, this was nothing compared to what we saw here. So what we can learn from this, which is really important, and it could be implemented into restoration projects, is that indeed, when you add phosphorus to plants that fix nitrogen, or can fix nitrogen, they're gonna go faster and larger. But on the other hand, if you look at plants that cannot associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria, uh, yes, they grow a little bit, but not that much. So other resources might be limiting these plants. And those resources can be water, can be nitrogen, or like even potassium. So there are other things that are happening here that we need to like disentangle. And finally, it seems like nutrients matter. So phosphorus matter for some plants, and this can have implications into practice. So how can we translate this into real practice? Well, I was really excited about that, and I decided to like see how we can translate this information into practice and look at the cost effectiveness. And for that, I decided to go to Colombia, and I decided to establish a project in southwestern Colombia where this dam was built and around 12,000 hectares of tropical dry forest need to be restored. So imagine how much effort you have to put in order to establish 12,000 hectares of tropical dry forest, given the conditions these plants have to uh, encounter. And I did this in collaboration with Francisco Torres from Fundación Natura. This NGO has been working in the area since 2014 and Beatriz Miranda from NL, who is the company that is running that dam. 
So we were really excited. And this is how our large scale restoration project looked like before we started. And for some of you, uh, you might think, OK, this looks like a healthy ecosystem. This looks like a prairie. But no, indeed, this should be looking like this. This should be a healthy forest. But for some reason, plants have not been able to colonize. So why is that? What's happening there? Well, we have some issues. The first one is we have low fertility. So um, people have been fertilizing these plants. We also don't have a lot of water, as I mentioned before. So watering has been happening. And also, we have some native grasses. So the seedlings we have been planting have to compete with these native grasses. So it's not that easy to grow here. So we were really excited. And we were working with this um, amazing field team and some undergrads. And thanks to them, we have been able to collect data um, even during the pandemic. So what we did here to be able to see what was going on and how we could actually implement this knowledge from shade houses into the field was to establish uh, 42 of these plots. So this is a plot. And in each of these plots, we were planting 271 individuals, and they belong to 11 different uh, native species. And we uh, decided to fertilize them. And I'm going to show you first the first treatment we implemented. And this is what this nonprofit has been using since 2014. So every single plant that has been planted in that area has been receiving 50 grams of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium plus water. And you might think, well, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it's actually a lot of fertilizer for a plant. Then with this information, we were like asking them, like, is this actually working? Do we know if this practice is like actually cost effective? Are plants growing more? And they were like, well, we actually don't know. We don't have the data. We have seen things, but we're not measuring them. And we decided to come up with a plan to be able to test if like these treatment uh, was actually effective. So we changed the amount of water and the amount of fertilizers plant we're getting. And because I wanted to add my component, I was like, can we please test what's going on with phosphorus? Is phosphorus the only nutrient limit in here? Or like these plants need everything and we just need to provide every single nutrient. Um, so we implemented this. This was a full factorial experiment, kind of, because we couldn't like do everything. And with that, um, we were able to establish this uh, right before the pandemic started. So these are our 42 plots. And there are seven hectares of these beautiful plots. Uh, three of them are going to be like 100 meter long. These are plots in 2020. And since 2020, we have been monitoring survival and growth. Right now, we're collecting data uh, for 2023. And I just want to show you how these plots look like in 2022. So, so far, you can see that, yeah, we have a lot of green. And these are not native species. These is our grass, our invasive grass growing. But in some plots, you can tell that some species, or like some plots, are doing better than others. So what's going on? Our act are actually our treatments like having an impact here? Well, I'm going to show you the results, and you are going to be shocked. So, just by looking at this, we were like, okay, let's see if our management practices are doing something. If our plants are surviving more often, they're growing more, and this is how our plots are going to look like. And bear with me. So, here we're going to, we're going to have our different treatments. First one is going to be our control. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have the percent survival. And all these symbols are our different pieces. And I don't need you to remember all these symbols. I just want you to see how much variability we have. This is just the control. So let's look at the other treatments. Again, we can see that there is a lot of variation, but not a lot of variation across treatments. So the treatment is not having actually an effect here, but there is something interesting. These three species are not surviving that often. And if we go and look at every single treatment, same species, they're not surviving that often. So something is going on. Something is happening with these species. And these are our usual suspects. They're right here. These are the three species that had pretty low survival. And I'm happy to tell you why later. Uh, but keep this in mind, because this is really important when you're thinking about the cost of these practices. 
So um, once we got these results, we were like, okay, is it worth it actually like planting these? Do we want to do that? So to try to answer this question, we first um, look at the cost of planting one of these seedlings. How much it costs to have each seedling surviving for two years? And again, uh, you're seeing all these symbols here and our treatments on the horizontal axis and then the cost per seedling in the y-axis. And you guys can see a pattern which is pretty easy to detect. There are some treatments that are really expensive and others that are not that expensive. And those treatments that are expensive are the ones that go at water. So imagine you're growing here, you need to be irrigated, and also you, you're not surviving that often. So this can have a lot of implications if you don't have a lot of money to keep restoring your area. So with this idea in mind, we have the cost, we have the survival, we decided to calculate this cost effectiveness after two years. And let me explain you what we did. So basically we said, imagine we're planting a hectare of these forests with one specific species. We know the cost of that. Then we're gonna survive that, we're gonna divide that by the percent survival of that species because we also have that data. So then with that, we can get the cost effectiveness of like having that species planted and restoring one hectare of these forests with only that species. So what we found was that here, we have the cost per hectare in the Y axis. So you can tell that it changes a lot. There is a lot of variation and there's one species that is not doing well. And that one is this species, really pretty, but the survival is pretty low. So basically this is telling us something really important. The identity of the species matters a lot when you're selecting and where you're deciding what to plant. So with that, I want to tell you a few things. The first thing is like fertilization doesn't always imply that you're going to have an increase in growth and survival. And I forgot to tell you something and you might be wondering, I didn't mention anything about growth. We found the same patterns for growth and survival. It didn't matter um, if we were adding fertilizers or not. It was the identity of the species driving um, the growth and the survival. The second thing we can learn is that um, when we incorporate this species identity, we can help determine how successful these restoration projects are gonna be and also how costly they're gonna be. And this is really important for stakeholders. People being on the ground, they need to know how much this is gonna cost. But this cannot just stop here. We need to start translating our science. We need to tell people what we're doing. We're not just like in a lab uh, trying to understand how species X relates to species B, they need to know what's the importance of that, what matters. And during my PhD, I spent a lot of time working with kids, showing them why the tropics were important, because a lot of people didn't know that tropical dry forests exist. Everyone was always picturing this beautiful rainy forest in Costa Rica. But I was like, no, there's more diversity beyond that. And that even motivated me and my um, lab mates to start working in this like kids book where we show different dry forests and we show different ecological phenomena happening here and how this information can help us restore forests in other countries. And we have this Coati traveling across all these countries, learning from all these different animals about different things that are happening in these forests and how this information can help us restore our dry forests. And this could be translated to any um, forest in the world if you just like think about the ecological concepts. And all this work motivated me to start thinking about policies because it's great to talk about people, but also we need to make sure that we are talking to the right people, the ones that can actually make a real change and an impact. So going back to restoration, so we know that we have big challenges. Things are happening so fast and we don't have a lot of time. And this is just a paper from uh, Brancaleon in 2019 showing where like 
we need to start restoring. And in these areas where you guys see uh, orange or perhaps red, these are hot spots where we need to start like on the ground establishing restoration. It could be natural regeneration, it could be tree planting. It depends on how these forests or like how these degraded areas are. And like Madagascar is one of those hot spots when we, where we need to start like working actively. But we have one issue or multiple issues. But one of those that I'm really excited about and thinking about lately is these forest plantations. And this is just a monoculture of a non-native species. And these plantations are basically competing with these areas where we need to restore. And I'm, just, I'm not just telling you this because I just woke up and thought, and thought about this. It's because like countries don't distinguish between three plantations with non-native species and restoration. For them, everything is like tree plantations. For most of them, not for everyone. And we all know, and everyone in this room can agree, that what we're doing here is slightly different compared to what we have here. We have biodiversity here. We have processes happening here. We have species coming. We even had a jaguar coming. I don't think we will be able to find a jaguar here. And if we only think about um, ecosystem services, we're not gonna find the same species pollinating, we're not gonna have the same biodiversity, even like the soil properties are gonna change a lot. So how can we balance these things? Well, before we start thinking about balancing things, we need to know what's the context right now. So this is just like, if we focus on Latin America, we know that tree plantations are around 1.6% of like uh, forested areas in Latin America. And that might not seem like a big number, but actually just imagine that the entire step of Missouri is covered by eucalyptus or pine, one single species. This is how bad it looks like in Latin America right now. And this is what the future looks like. And this is coming from data that countries have been reporting. So they are thinking that this is gonna be the future. Three plantations are gonna be our future and we're gonna increase them by 2%. So we have a huge challenge as restoration ecologies, as taxonomies, as people thinking about conservation, because we need to make sure that the face of my dog, that is maybe the face that you are giving me right now, how can we balance these things? What can we do with all this information? Well, I have some ideas. Okay, so to be able to see how these things can, like coexist, the first thing we need to do is we need to talk to the forest sector. We need to know what they're doing. What's the present right now? Where are they planting? What species are planting? How are they planting them? And we have to talk to them because they are the ones that are like driving this movement. Countries are providing this like amazing stage, but they're the ones implementing the actions. And beyond like thinking about what's the present, we need to think about the future. We need to think about how many of these species are gonna be native species. Are they thinking about having native species? What management strategies they're gonna have? How can we harness all this potential that they have propagating species to propagate species that are native and that can actually provide ecosystem services and also livelihoods to the communities that live in this area. So thanks to all of this, uh, we have been thinking about how we can get together with the forest sector. We already started doing this at Yale. And right now we're thinking about establish, establishing a forest dialogue, which basically means that we're gonna sit down with stakeholders, people doing restoration, people working on tree plantations, uh, politicians thinking about how we can actually restore forests uh, in this case for Ecuador. We have been working on this and are, we're planning on having this dialogue happening uh, at the end of this year or early uh, 2024 to make sure that we're all talking the same language. Because in some cases, there is a lot of willingness to like restore ecosystems, but people don't know where to start. So we want to set, set the stage for this. Because at the end, what we want is to be able to balance tree plantations, conservation, and restoration, and to make sure that these monkeys are gonna have something to eat. Same as the lemurs we, some of you saw yesterday, that those lemurs are gonna be able to have 
healthy habitats where like their food is going to be provided and they don't have to basically go to areas where they do not belong to find the resources they need. And with that, I want to mention that what I want is to encourage the forest sector that has a lot of willingness to participate in these restoration and conservation initiatives to actually engage. They have a lot of power, they have a lot of resources, and we have all the knowledge. So we can bring that knowledge and they can bring the resources, they have the land, so we can start like having healthy areas that are going to be restored with some uh, tree plantations that can be tree plantations of native species. So these two things can coexist. And on top of that, um, I want to make sure that with this information, we can go back and talk to countries and we can tell them, hey, we learned this from this country. This was successful. Maybe this could get implemented um, in your country so we can start like changing these natural forest laws. And I forgot to mention, but we have been working on that with Lyndon Bull from FAO, trying to like show to the forest sector and show to countries that they have to start acting right now, that we need to start this movement happening. And with that, I hope I convince you that in order to like make sure that these seedlings one day are going to become a forest, we don't just need to wait. It's not about time. It's about like knowing about the identity of the species, the ecology and the biology. We also need to know a little bit about the cost. Otherwise, people are not going to be willing to invest resources on this. And also, we need to engage with stakeholders at different levels, from like people in cities to people changing laws. Um, and that's how I see myself being part of the Missouri Botanical Garden as a researcher. Integrating these three components will be key to make sure that all restoration activities are going to be successful in the future. And I want to show you how I see myself working here. What are my plans? So um, what I would like to do is like, I want to be working in areas that are in danger ecosystems. I want to bring those ecosystems back. And I'm planning on doing these from like three perspectives. And these are flexible. But these are things that I'm really excited about. The first one is looking at below ground processes and how these below ground processes can play a huge role in restoration outcomes. Um, the second one is like thinking about cost-effective prairie restoration. And the last one is linking conservation and restoration. Because these two, even though they should be talking to each other more often, sometimes they don't talk to each other that often. So let me start by the first one. So, so far, I've been telling you a lot about tree growth, tree survival, but I keep forgetting something really important. What's going on below ground? What's happening? What do we know about this? How is this impacting that these seedlings are establishing? So thinking about that, I want to like evaluate these below ground processes. I want to know how they're impacting the success of restoration projects. Because these below ground processes are really important for nutrient cycling and for carbon storage. So we should not forget about these things. And my goal will be, and I'm actually working on this right now, is to um, try to compare how different restoration management practices are impacting these below ground processes. And we are looking at natural regeneration and tree planting. And I'm working on this NSF proposal to look at how different projects across the tropics um, have been recovering these below ground processes. And I'm doing this in collaboration with a network that um, focus mainly on below ground things but they're also excited about what's going on above ground. So this is my first idea, but I also have a great idea about prairies because we're in an area that needs to restore prairies. Um, and we know that these prairies are gonna be experiencing like changes in rainfall regimes and also temperatures are gonna increase. Um, so how can, we, how can we use this like morphological and physiological traits to inform uh, how these pieces are gonna perform in the future? And when we are selecting for like species or like some morphotypes, how this is going to be impacting cost effectiveness if we're also on top of that adding some management strategies. And I would love to do some like experiments or conduct some experiments in um, the show nature reserve. That would be a dream. And 
also, I would like to uh, incorporate these amazing task force, which is like the kids and the community, because these parties are like really important for them. They bring a lot of ecosystem services. So having them involved in these projects and showing them how important these parties are, not only for pollination, but also for their own health and mental health, um, will be really valuable for me. And lastly, I mentioned that I want to link conservation and restoration. So here at the garden, we have a lot of information about like endangered species, where they grow. So we could actually use species distribution models to inform where these species are going to be growing, where would be potential for these species to exist. And this information, then we can translate it to people uh, propagating these pieces that then are going to be providing these pieces to projects like this one in Colombia. But this could happen in Madagascar or in Peru and Bolivia. So this is a way to harness all the potential that the garden has and what the garden has been working on for many years with uh, conservation and restoration. And with that, I hope I convince you that we really need to know a lot about the biology, the ecology, and the physiology of the plants. We need to link that with the cause of these practices. And then we need to engage with stakeholders if we want to make sure that the Missouri Botanical Garden is going to be informing restoration programs, and not just restoration programs, but like we're going to be basically setting the base for forests that are going to be functional in the future. And we're going to be informing that for everyone across the globe. And with that, I want to thank you, all my collaborators and funding sources. I should uh, be really thankful to have received many uh, funding from like organizations like the Slangenberg Foundation and the PO Foundation that cares a lot about uh, women in science and women in science in developing countries. And also, I want to mention how important these role models have been through my career. I'm really thankful for everything I have learned from them. And finally, I want to invite you to ask me any questions. And thank you so much for your time and for being here and listening to another talk. <laughs>